I was asked recently what I was like as a teenager. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be kicked in the stomach by a horse than have to think about that. Fortunately, unlike today, there are very few images of that time. <laughs> but I think I've found one that really captures my badly bleached, tipped, rock star, 80s mullet. <laughs> What's even better is <laughs> that at one stage, my boyfriend, Darren, and I had matching spiral perm mullets. <laughs> what can I say? Wasn't a great time. <laughs> this is hard to believe, but the internal was actually more tragic than the external. I was a walking contradiction. Weekdays boasted academic and sporting success and weekends I spent escaping the trauma that comes from childhood sexual abuse by drowning myself in drugs and alcohol. By my late teens, addiction fueled by feelings of worthlessness nearly killed me. What dominates most, though, is I felt completely at odds with the world. It's like I wasn't around when they were handing out a crucial piece of the puzzle to life. Even at this early age, I was subconsciously propelled to help others who felt this same way. And I was so determined to solve the mystery of the missing piece of the puzzle. Don't ever underestimate the power of the subconscious in a high achiever. 30 odd foster kids later, a few adopted, one of my own, a degree in social science and 20 years of professional practice in the youth sector and I think I've finally cracked it. <laughs> you, you see, the, the adventure of the mind, it's not outside us, it's within us. My journeys caused me to question everything I thought I knew and tip it on its head. Challenging preconceived ideas can be an endless and highly unpredictable undertaking. What I now know is what I'm about to share with you, and I didn't learn this from years at university. I learnt this from the many thousands of interactions with young people and adults, observing the way they chose to deal with pain, tragedy, and trauma. The missing piece of the puzzle came subtly in parts over time. Much of it was found through the many years of fostering children. The greatest challenge was helping them to come to terms with their often harrowing life stories. I'd always talk to the boys when they were busy doing something, freeing them from the shame of having to make eye contact. And the girls would wait till all was still, often late at night, and the night mind would start to wreak havoc. These late nights and difficult conversations spent sifting and sorting through their experiences, it's not only the greatest challenge, but by far the biggest gift. I was in the youth space for 20 years. I've watched with keen interest the rise of the resilience movement. It's a hot topic. If Apple is the genius solution to the IT world, then resilience is being presented as the answer to the growing tide of discontent in our culture. As a public speaker now, I've been asked to talk on resilience many times, but I found myself stumbling over a flaw that I was yet to understand. The Oxford Dictionary's definition of resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulty. Toughness, in inverted commas. As a child of the 70s and 80s, I was constantly told to toughen up, get over it, shit happens. And my all-time favourite, if I cried, brutal words. Don't be such a drama queen. <laughs> so resilience is not a new age concept at all. We've just fancied up the rhetoric to describe an age-old toughen up in spite of mantra. I now know that resilience is not where it's at. It's not enough. The message is not landing and we are setting the bar too low. And most importantly, we're missing a key ingredient that creates a crucial weakness in the teaching and concept of resilience. People don't rise to low expectations, so why are we teaching resilience? Because the fact is we are born resilient. We are born hardwired for struggle and we are born to bounce back, but it's not enough. 
I've worked with hundreds of people struggling who did not lack resilience. I've lost loved ones and friends to suicide who did not lack resilience. If resilience was enough, then why is suicide the leading cause of death for our young people? It's not only our young people that are leading the charge in discontent. Our adult population is now the second highest consumers of antidepressants globally. And I don't think it's a lack of resilience that's setting individuals or our society at odds with the world. It's not that resilience is a flawed concept. It's just not enough. It's not what forms the backbone to overcome adversity or achieve success. When I first started my inquiry into the missing piece of the puzzle, I had to look beyond myself for an answer that I didn't even know existed. I began to look at the great leaders of the world, people I admired, contented people. What, what did they have in common? What was this magic formula? Resilience wasn't absent, but it really is. The more I investigated, the clearer it became. What was common to them all? It was acceptance. They'd all accepted their realities as harsh as they may be. And they'd used them to not only better themselves, but to serve the greater good. As appalling as Mandela's imprisonment, he never once used it as a tool for hatred and revenge. He used it as a tool to strive beyond it. Martin Luther King united people through the acknowledgement and acceptance of a shared pain and a belief that rose from that very place. The humble acceptance of their experiences enabled them to lead and left a timeless mark. Acceptance gave them the capacity to carry on because of their experiences, not in spite of them. Our kids are resilient. We are resilient. We have taught resilience and we continue to do so. If we keep relying on resilience alone, lives will continue to be lost. Acceptance needs to be the new mantra. So what does resilience look like without acceptance? If you're on a ship and it's going down, your resilience will get you to the lifeboats. But if no one on that ship accepts that it's sinking, no one will deploy the lifeboats. Note the problem. Your resilience can only get you so far. When you're having a tantrum, whether it be internal or external, we always try and be internal, it doesn't always work. <laughs> what are you feeling in that moment? If I was to suggest you were having a tantrum because you were lacking resilience, does that land? What if I was to say that your tantrum stemmed from a frustration around your inability to accept a situation, person, place or thing? Does that feel more accurate? You see, it's, it's the resilience that inspires that internal fight, but it's a lack of acceptance that motivates the meltdown. So what would our society look like if we taught acceptance as opposed to resilience? I personally think the supermarket checkout with a three and a five-year-old would be a far more appealing experience. <laughs> How many of you have been through the earth-shattering blow of a relationship breakdown? Not a graceful moment in life. The hysterical, snot-ridden state that we are all reduced to. In the coming days, weeks and months of continued heartache, you can be sure of a few things. If a friend tells you to get over it, you're no longer friends. <laughs> You'll make a valiant attempt at resilience and carrying on in spite of your pain. But in my experience, this involves a bottle, usually two, of wine, and lasts until you sober up. And if you think heartache's bad, throw a hangover on top. 
I love the little bits of knowing laughter. Mm -hmm. Mm. (laughs) Eventually you'll hear the gentle words of a friend. Honey, you're going to have to accept that it's over. Why do they say this? Well, they're probably shagging your ex. (laughs) But let's just give them the benefit of the doubt. (laughs) and assume that they actually have your best interests at heart. And they say this because we know that the moment we accept, we begin the slow journey forward. Acceptance is the fundamental driver of any forward movement. So acceptance was the missing piece of the puzzle, but why is it so hard for us to accept our realities? I'm going to risk being called a smart ass at this point and say it's possibly because we're not taught. But there's another barrier to acceptance in our society and what I now know about this barrier is not just what I've learnt through working with others. I know this from my own experience because for most of my life I denied my experiences because they were not meant to happen to me. I came from a loving home. I went to a good school. We are all taught in this society that there are two different types of people, them and us. The things that happened to me were not meant to happen to people like me. They were meant to happen to those sorts of people and you know the ones I'm talking about. The ones you're encouraged not to play with when you're young the ones that go to those schools, wear those clothes, drive those cars and will end up doing the jobs that I will never have to do. They'll deal with the issues that I'll never have to deal with. They even make reality TV shows and comedy skits about those people and we laugh at the madness of their worlds. And we judge and we continue to judge and I do it too. But I challenge myself not to. And here's how. I'm going to ask you to stand. (laughs) Don't panic, I'm standing, it's actually okay. I'm going to ask you to stand if you or anyone you know has experienced even one of the following mentioned. Drug or alcohol abuse, mental health issues, anxiety, really? No one in this room knows anyone who's dealt with anxiety or depression. Oh, that's better. Job loss, divorce, separation, self-esteem issues. Wow, I think I can stop there. Have a good look around. Do a circle. Look around the room. Where are they? They're right here. They're us and we are them. There is no them and us. There is only us. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely none of us are an exception to life's rules and chaos. Every single one of us in this room, in this world, will experience things that leave us shocked, stunned, and at times absolutely bewildered. Those that achieve greatness know that the bigger the, the bigger the challenge, the greater the gift. For want of a better term, I like to call them gifts in shitty wrapping paper. I can now thank my rather colourful and layered life for this understanding and a resulting capacity for connection, empathy and service. A lack of acceptance can be lethal. I know because it nearly killed me. Recently I was put to the test on everything I've learnt. On Christmas Day we lost our family home in the fires at Wairua. A couple of weeks after that I split with my partner and three days after that my beautiful mum died. Somewhere in that chaos my last child left home. I looked around and there was absolutely nothing familiar left. 
except for my belief in acceptance. I still had that and I prayed to God that it would be enough. Given that I find myself standing here several months later, I guess it was. Many years ago I was working as a school counsellor and I met a gorgeous girl called Indy. Ironically, she'd just lost both of her parents to cancer. Her grief was beyond measure. She was self-harming and suicidal with nothing to keep her going. Naturally, I adopted her. (laughs) And we began our journey. But her grief was unshakable and I feared for her life daily. When Indy was 16, we were both made ambassadors for Adopt Change with Deborah Lee Finesse and Hugh Jackman, and we headed to Sydney to meet you and Deb, who I knew were so excited to meet us. (laughs) Um, Indy was asked to share her story, and the first few times were brutal, and she broke down, leaving me to finish the speech. Then I watched something really interesting happen. The more she shared her story, the more she began to accept it and realise that it could actually benefit others. In that one week, this girl turned her whole life around. The darkness lifted and a light came into her eyes. She could now carry on because of her experiences, not in spite of them. Recently, I was talking at a school on this exact topic And I shared Indy's story and several others of a similar nature. Afterwards, a young girl, perhaps 14, clearly shy, came up to me and handed me a note. I asked her what it was. She simply said, thank you, but I won't be needing it anymore. She walked off. As I watched her walk off, I opened the note. It was a suicide note. She didn't hand me the note because she'd suddenly become resilient. That she already had. She handed me the note because she came to accept her story. And she realised that this acceptance was far less likely to kill her. She has the missing piece of the puzzle. And she can now carry on because of her experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.